Hello, everyone, and welcome to another live edition here on my channel, Luis Borrero, Visual Artist. Welcome to those for you that are joining today. Um, today, I'm going to be working on a live demonstration here. As you can see, this is a Goya uh, painting from 1810. The title of the painting is Victor Gouillet. And uh, I believe that there's a, another demonstration that I uploaded to the channel uh, detailing just the ground and the initial lay-in of this painting. But in this live demonstration in particular, I'm going to be working live here, uh, working some of the details of the coat and just uh, just having a, a, a for open forum for those of you that are joining uh, and have questions. I've had a lot of questions about the quality of a velatura and impasto. So this is a good opportunity for you that are joining to uh, ask questions and uh, just do some engagement here with me uh, while I'm painting. So um, just to sort of detail what I'm doing here, um, and for those of you that are just uh, joining for the first time, the channel's dedicated to uh, old master techniques, in particular uh, Goya and a lot of painters uh, fr from the 17th or I guess Renaissance to the up to the 19th century. I'm interested in historic materials, and I'm using historical colors here. In, here, I'm going to detail the palette. Uh, stack process lead white. In this, for this demonstration, I'm using uh, Naples yellow light, yellow ochre, raw sienna, Spanish red ochre, Italian raw umber, vine black, and Prussian blue. In some of the past presentations, I've detailed. Um, these palettes, in particular, the colors that Goya would have been using and the colors that would have been available to him during the 18th century. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, and I'm also using vermilion here, so let's not forget that one. That's a key color for the flesh. And uh, what, I'm, what I'm doing is a, a theoretical sequence, a working sequence of how Goya would have laid in the painting. And for those of you that watched the last uh, upload, on detailing the demonstration or the, the process, I started with a underdrawing, a very schematic underdrawing using vine charcoal. Uh, sometimes uh, there's uh, a record of scientists finding um, underdrawings, transfer underdrawings in some of his paintings, not all. There's some sketches that were done directly on this orange ground, as you can see here. And it seems that he went back and forth. He did both the uh, orange ground uh, application directly, and then he would let it dry, and then he would just uh, go for uh, a direct painting, uh, draw, drawing with the brush, probably uh, a polecat hair brush or a mongoose hair brush or even a sable brush, as you can see here. And it seems that he was very direct, working directly with the brush. And he would just build up the painting much like Velazquez or even a Venetian painter. It doesn't seem that he uh, worked with a grisaille layer and then, you know, worked with uh, glazes on top. It seems like it was just direct painting. So that's the approach that I'm taking here. And it's, it's, in, um, it's in accord with a lot of other Spanish painters especially Baroque Spanish painters. They were very direct, such as Velazquez and uh, uh, Martinez del Mazo. Um, also, um, Suboran el Greco. They're mostly direct painters influenced by the Venetians. So that's the approach that I'm taking. And today I would just want to work with some impasto um, overpainting on top of this black. And if you could see in the reproduction, there's some details that are done in Naples yellow and also in with yellow ochre. That's what I'm going to be doing. I'm also going to be working on the coat. I've been painting now for a few hours on the face, so this is completely wet. So I'm just going to be working and uh, taking your questions as I'm working. So feel welcome to uh, post your questions here in the uh, questions section. And uh, I'm, I'll be happy to answer any, any doubts that you may have. So I'm using a mall stick, and this is something that I usually use when I'm working with details. I've been working on the face. This is my second layer. I worked with uh, 
vermilion, lead white, yellow ochre, and a little bit of black mixed with a little bit of Prussian blue, just to get my cooler tones. And the reproduction looks a lot warmer, and it's because my the camera is uh, essentially um, doing creating a distortion in the color, but the color is a lot more subtle, but it is overexposing the color a little bit. So, um, so let's just go ahead and uh, just start establishing some color here, especially in the collar. And I'm going to make some. The, the collar is mostly approached with impasto. I'm mixing a little bit of Prussian blue with a little bit of this yellow ochre, just to get this sort of greenish color. So, and a little bit of vine black. And I want somewhat of a thick paint here. And let's see, this area seems like he applied the paint pretty thickly, and it's like a greenish grayish color. And this is just directly over the ground. I'm using a sable brush. Why am I using a sable brush? Well, I find that a lot of the impasto qualities of some of these old paintings, I could achieve better with just using the side of the brush, particularly a sable brush. And this gives you a really nice, breaks up the paint quite nicely, especially with the lead white. And by using the side of the brush, I can just enforce. For those of you that are joining for the first time, um, welcome to my channel. I just want to remind everyone to subscribe. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, make sure to subscribe if you're enjoying the content and share the content with your friends. And also, for those of you that are interested in uh, a more um, complete course, I just released my uh, Rembrandt course on Udemy. There is a coupon below where you could get a discount. So make sure to check that uh, link in the description below. You could find that coupon. If you use the word painting, you could get a really nice discount on the Udemy server. So. So a lot of other courses that are dedicated to drawing. So I'm just go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, apply this paint just right over what I have here with the side of this sable brush. You can see how the paint just sort of breaks up. It gives you this really beautiful impasto. I don't like to use bristle brushes, and I'll tell you why. The bristle brush will smooth out the paint, and it won't really give you uh, the really nice breakup or this broken quality. Uh, you, it's just too thick. So here I'm just using this nice sable brush by Skoda. So these are Spanish brushes that I really love. And you can just see here that it's almost like a, a scumble. You'll see in a lot of Velasquez paintings that he sort of drags the paint and he leaves the undercolor to show through. And that's exactly what I'm going to do here. For those of you that are wondering what reproduction I'm using, um, I'm using an image from Google Arts and Culture from their server. There, if you go to the Goya portfolio, you could find this image of Victor Goya. A beautiful portrait of a small boy I absolutely love. And you can see here, it's, this, it's important that the paint be dry. If you're working with oils and your paint is not dry, you're going to have the, the, the paint that's underneath mix, and you're not going to get this optical color. So it's important that the paint be dry. That's so important. And I just want to pick up more color. You can see that it's this sort of greenish, grayish color mixing Prussian blue, black. And the black is just to kill the color a little bit. This Prussian blue that I'm using is very intense. It's from natural pigments. It's a beautiful color, but it, it, it is very intense. So if you use it pure, 
you're going to find that it's just it's a little bit too too intense. It will not harmonize with the rest of the paint. So um, I have uh, some visitors. Carlos, uh, welcome to the channel. And uh, and let's see. Uh, I'm not in the chat right now. I could answer your questions here live. So if you have any questions that you may have, I could answer them here live on the on this, you know, while I'm painting. So but welcome everyone to the channel. Thank you for joining. I appreciate the support. So there you see that I'm using um, sort of an impasto quality that is quite beautiful. If you use a sable brush, this is, again, this is a number six sable brush. I imagine you could use a mongoose hair brush. I love the mongoose hair brushes. And I use the brush on the side. So that gives me the broken quality that you're seeing here. Again, the bristle brush is just too, it'll smooth out the paint. And I don't, I, I'm not really looking for that quality right now. So uh, I see a lot of painters um, using a, 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 a bristle brush to apply impasto. And a lot of these subtle, I mean, if I just take this brush and just drag the brush right over the tip of the brush, I could achieve this sort of drag quality to the paint, especially this, this stack process light white, and it gives me optical color. So these touches just go right on top. And that's what I love about some of these paintings, the uh, ingenuity in the way that the paint is applied is just uncanny. I mean, uh, it, not everything's wet into wet. This painting has a combination of wet into wet. And I'm just touching the color here just to work on that edge. Now, this is wet. I've been working on this all day, so I could essentially take that color and just soften that edge. So that's what I'm gonna do right here. I'm gonna take this wet into wet color and soften the edge right here. Just to give more roundness to that form. So you could tell, if you paint a lot, you'll be able to tell which areas were done wet into wet and this is really important, realizing what is seco painting. This is seco, meaning it's dry paint on top of dry paint, or excuse me, uh, wet paint on top of dry paint. And then wet into wet is essentially working into a couch, which is essentially maybe putting a, some sort of medium and working up your second layer. So this, is, this was done uh, wet into wet. This has been uh, applied uh, seco. So, if you want impasto quality, especially with stack process light white, which really gives you some beautiful um, uh, impasto qualities for your paintings, and that's what I'm doing here, I'm going to go ahead and apply some of those tones by just dragging the paint to the side of the brush. And the paint breaks up really nicely. yellow ochre, a little bit of black, and a little bit of Prussian blue. Now, when you uh, mix your, uh, your tones, and if you're interested in creating a, a cooler black, then you could use the Prussian, Prussian blue, and this creates a blue black. In the market, that's known as blue black. So it's a beautiful color. And it's cool, it's like, you know, it's like a sort of steel, it gives you the steel gray mixtures that are wonderful. And it seems that Goya did that. I've seen that in a lot of um, uh, media analysis, and chemical analysis. Seems like they find that mixture a lot, in, especially in 19th century artists. So, so I'm just applying this color right over the ground. 
And you could apply this in a couple layers, you know, I mean, you could let that dry and then just go, go back into it. Uh, it seems that these impostos in this area right here are done that way. So that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be applying some touches of yellow ochre and uh, Naples yellow, and that'll give me that the, the appearance of sort of a brocade pattern or some sort of gold um, uh, embellishment to the to the coat. So you see that in a lot of Rembrandt paintings, they use the impasto to create the details. It's a beautiful technique. And I highly recommend the use of um, a sable brush or a, a polecat hair brush uh, or a mongoose hairbrush to do that. Again, by using the side of the brush. By the way, um, I just released my Rembrandt course. A lot of you have purchased this course. I want to be, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> very adamant about being thankful uh, for your wonderful support. And I know a lot of you have been writing about the course, and I finally was able to release it. So thank you for your support. For those of you that are interested, check out the link below and uh, you could get a discount. Um, let's see. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, Mastery, I believe, is coming by. Thank you for your visit once again. And uh, I thank you for your feedback. Um, it says here, will you apply a wash to the face after it dries to tint it down? So that's a good question. And yes, the the face, uh, What I what I'm doing right now is applying uh, more opaque paint uh, in the second layer. And one thing that happens with the, the, the reddish ground, unfortunately, is that the paint will die, will sink in, and the tones will no longer be as bright as the, in the first layer. And um, it, the varnish will also uh, create this sort of, you know, yellowish quality to, to the paint. So um, it's sort of best to, uh, let the paint dry and gauge to see if the values are too light. And from there, see how the paint is going to age because this ground is um, notorious for uh, darkening because of the, if you have red, you know, a reddish color underneath and thin layers of flesh color on top. So that's why uh, the paint, uh, the, uh, a lot of um, academies did away with the red ochre ground because it, the paintings do darken more significantly more than uh, the lighter ground. So um, the painting that you see of Goya's is probably aged and, you know, there's a varnish there. So um, it's, and also, I also have three or four lights over this painting. So if, if you were to see this painting in a, re, re, you know, regular light, daylight, um, the tone would not be as bright because the lead white is reflecting a lot of the, the lights that I have for the video. So uh, it does seem much more darker. But if you wanted to, if you got too light, you could essentially take it back and then repaint it. Um, but that's essentially, you know, uh, if you're uh, looking for a very dark painting, which in this case, I know that is probably not the case. I mean, the, the painting, I've seen this painting in Washington, and it seems that the, the color is very bright. So... Uh, or the whites are much whiter than, you know, they appear in the reproduction. So, um, yeah, that's, thank you for your question, though, and your concern. That's, uh, that's a good, good, uh, good feedback there to uh, sort of, um, you know, let viewers know that there is, there, there is a, a shift in the tones, and the lead white is very reflective of light. So the more lights that you have on here to get the exposure of the video, the more light is going to reflect back into the camera. So, okay, so let's just continue here. And I've had a lot of questions um, from the viewers, the subscribers, asking me about velatura and paint qualities. And I just want to um, tell you about this. Now, I, I never paint my flesh tones as a wash, okay? I usually, especially in something like this, it's very, uh, there, there's body paint on there. And I am using a couch of oil and working into that. And in some areas, the paint will be thinner. But I consider that velatura, not a glaze. Velatura, what is the difference? A glaze, the background's essentially glazed. There's no white 
you're using I'm using the red of the ground uh, to let the you know to let that red show through over the black or excuse me underneath the black um, so that I consider that as a glaze but the white paint or the lighter color paint uh, it's not a glaze it's a velatura because it has white so you really want to uh, be able to capture the flesh tone in a sort of a cool cooler tone and in semi-translucent and opaque tones so uh, if i come over here and i just apply for example some flesh tone you'll realize that it's quite opaque you know i'm, I'm putting these lights and they're covering the surface but not entirely and that is the quality of the velatura and to do that you need some uh, uh lead white essentially i mean the lead white is translucent when applied thinly and very opaquely when applied thickly that's what i'm doing with the impasos over here in the shirt for example so by just applying the paint thickly which i'm going to do right here i could just pick up with the tip of the brush this color and create a, a you know a, a, an opacity now if you want a translucency well you just you could either just wipe the excess of your brush and then just come back here and just apply the color by just dragging it and that creates a translucent quality so this is something that you see um, Velasquez do you'll see that in some areas of his painting he's just sort of there's a lot of brush marks where he's cleaning the brush well he's doing that to be able to get the the velatura effect um, so if I wanted to for example go back into the face I don't want to mix any oil into the paint I just want to wipe the excess paint and just come back in here and just create a velatura and that's essentially a velatura right there it's so subtle that the camera may not even pick it up but it's just a, a beautiful a translucent quality to the white and that's difficult to do with lead, uh, excuse me, with titanium white. You see that uh, effect in a lot of the old master paintings. It's the velatura uh, being applied with the lead white. And also, if you are working, uh, you know, passages that are very soft, you could use a squirrel hair brush and just create an even thinner effect by just sort of fusing the paint together. I like to call I like to uh, name this fusing together, not so much blending because it's you're not really blending the colors. What you're doing is you're you're just softening the transitions. So the colors are being mixed on the palette. They're being applied on the, the surface. So for example, if my brushwork gets too crazy here, I could, with the form, I could just thin it and create this very beautiful, soft effect. So this is described by a lot of uh, the, the uh, manuals on painting. And it's a really gorgeous effect. So you could paint very loosely and then use this brush to sort of soften and create a very beautiful effect. Um, I do have to confess, this is a very beautiful white that I'm using. It's really hard to achieve this with, you know, a, a commercial um, titanium white. You could do it with some of the higher brands um, of lead white, such as Williamsburg. Now, if you're wondering about materials, on the description below, I have a kit uh, where I have described some of the materials that I'm using for some of my courses. So if you're interested in some of those materials, visit the link below uh, to uh, just learn more about some of these materials that I'm using that I recommend. Now, the materials that I'm using here are not those described in the kit. I, these are handmade materials that I use for the uh, demonstrations just because they're historical colors. So I want to be using the, the same exact colors or at least the closest um, 
colors that I could find on the market um, to create some of the effects that I'm noticing on some of the paintings. So the historical colors for Goya's palette I got from natural pigments. And they have Prussian blue, which is this blue right here, and the Naples yellow light. And I'm gonna just put it, and you can see how strong this Prussian blue is. I mean, it's really strong, so you have to cut it back with black. Otherwise, it'll just, it's not gonna harmonize nicely with this very muted color. So I'm using that Prussian blue for this bluish greenish color here. And again, this is a, a demonstration, a live demonstration. I've been working on this painting for a little while. I don't pretend that, you know, uh, in some of the demonstration I, I have done a very quick uh, time lapse and with just a very quick explanation of the whole process. This is more in depth so you can see um, how I'm just applying the paint, which I've had a lot of questions here on the channel. So let's see, I have here uh, a question from B.A. Hum Humdinger. Um, is this effect similar to the turbid medium effect? Indeed, it is the turbid medium effect. That's exactly what you're seeing here. Lighter color over a dark color, you get a turbid medium effect. And with this ground, even more so. Um, so uh, Rembrandt, Velasquez, and a lot of the 17th century and Baroque painters started taking advantage of that effect because it's very quick. I mean, by just dragging light paint over a dark ground or a light or darker paint, you could achieve these sort of tangible, sensory tangible effects that are going to really give you maximum visual power, you know? So, and even without much rendering here, you get, you get to see that how uh, this sort of creates uh, a sensory effect on the surface. And that, that really is specifically with the impasto. So from a distance, you get a sense of that is some, you know, some sort of fabric. So that's what I love about some of these techniques that are just really, uh, you know, they're sort of, um, they're descriptive of textures without you actually having to spend hours and hours uh, modeling, you know, every detail. So... Um, that's essentially what, when you look at Venetian painting, that's their gift to us. <laughs> I like to think of it that way. So, um, and let's see, I'm going to just continue to apply some of these. Let's see, probably I need a darker value here. And again, I don't pretend that this is a full course. By no means, I... I I have a disclaimer about it. I'm making this disclaimer here. This is not a, a painting course. This is this is just an introduction um, to some of these techniques. These are very complex techniques, and I've spent years researching a lot of this information. And I like to share it with you guys um, to an audience that is, you know, uh, receptive to the information. And uh, I really love the engagement that I get from you guys. So I really appreciate that. That's really great. You guys are following the channel and asking your questions. So, and it could help a lot of you, uh, you know, just discover new ways of working. So that's that's essentially uh, one of the reasons that I that I like sharing a lot of this information. So, so again, I'm uh, wanting to create this nice tangible feel to the paint, and here. By over painting or applying the paint just directly over, over that area, just with the tip of the brush, I'm able to create some of those beautiful effects that Goya's uh, achieving in his, his, uh, in his beautiful painting of Victor Gruyere. So, the side of the brush is really. Uh, Using the side of the brush is, is really going to help you a lot. And in some areas, he goes more opaque, for example, in this area right here. And by, by just 
sort of putting that on top of a dark, already established dark background, you get this really nice feel that that's in front because it actually is physically in front. It's much, much like the way an abstract painter works where they're uh, letting a color dry and they're just juxtapos uh, using juxtaposition or uh, colors, actual paint on top of paint to create that sense of depth. That's essentially what I'm doing here. It's the same strategy. So let's just go over here with thicker paint and with the tip of the brush, just applying some of that impasto as well. This is a type of painting that I really enjoy this and, you know, just um, creating these textures with these wonderful materials. There's no oil in here. If you put oil, you, you ruin the impasto quality. So you want to uh, hold back on the oil when you're working with impasto. Now there is fatty impastos. Rembrandt used fatty impastos. But in this case, it doesn't seem like Goya is using any sort of fatty impasto here. The paint feels very dry, much um, like he's just dragging the paint. So in some areas, it seems like the paint has more, a lot more fluid. And for those areas, I am going to put it thin the paint just slightly with a bit of oil. I usually don't use a lot of oil in the, in the lights. I use the, the oil mostly in the darks. So, uh, for example, in this area right here, where I want the paint to be slightly thinner, probably need a little bit of yellow ochre there. And same here, this area. This area is painted very boldly. It doesn't seem that he, this, there's no fussing there. Um, it seems like he's, and that's what makes uh, Goya a genius, you know. He's um, painting with a lot of bravura, as the Spaniards called it, and just achieving some beautiful effects. All right, so now what I want to do is I'm going to just try to achieve some of these effects here by mixing let, nope, Naples yellow. Sometimes I get confused. This almost feels like Latin yellow. Very similar. This one seems brighter though than the Latin yellow. And I tested this mixture out before and I researched it. Yellow ochre and Naples yellow gives you this sort of beautiful lemon color. And it just with the tip of the brush, just going to lay it right on top. And it seems that he used, um, there's like maybe two or three layers. Um, I'm probably going to have to go back at some point. Uh, this is, it, it, to me, it seems that there's yellow, but underneath the yellow, there's also uh, sort of some sort of lead white. So he just sort of retouches. Um, on top with the brighter color. So let's just try that strategy, mix another tone here. And I'm gonna switch. He probably did it in two layers. The first layer is probably white, but let's try to do it in one. It's kind of neat. That's why copying is so important because a lot of times when you're copying, you realize that painter use uh, a technique that perhaps we're not familiar with. And here you can see that he used the side of the brush. You got to switch the tones. You can't just do it all yellow because then it becomes boring.
It's painted right on top. Here's another passage of the lighter color. Seems like it's yellow, lead white. And with just the side of the brush, just dabbing the surface just slightly. Again, what's underneath is dried already. So that's important that uh, you, you take that into account because you don't want to work and it's, it's translucent. I mean, I haven't really covered that surface uh, with full opaque black paint. There's, I thin down the black and I apply the wash and then I'm putting the, the color right on top, so. And I don't pretend to copy this exactly because these are, this, this depends on a lot of accident here, so. But let's try. Seems like there's, there's these details, so these dots. And that's why paintings are so unique. I mean, it's, this is a combination of the artist um, calligraphy with, you know, whatever color he mixed or was able to achieve. So, like there's these patterns on there. It's a beautiful, beautiful painting. I really love Goya and his uh, technique of impasto and just glazes. It doesn't seem like he glazed much, but there is evidence that in some areas early on he did glaze. So, And the use of black, like a lot of these masters, is just uncanny. I mean, they use black everywhere. So let's just come over here and create this really nice. And I, again, I'm picking up the paint with the tip of my brush. And there I'm, it seems like you sort of move the brush like this in a round, two round strokes to create that. Sort of like a dabbing effect. There's layers there. I mean, that's and probably the best course of action is perhaps to let that dry and then to layer on top. So let's see. Um, I have another question from Humdinger. Okay, so I think this is a stronger portrait without the gold stitching on the clothing. Uh, if it wasn't a study, would you agree? Um, so it's that's interesting. Um, I think that. It, believe it or not, these um, these portraits uh, are. The, it seems that the Spaniards are very interested in el decoro. El decoro is uh, in in English is I guess you could translate it to decorum. And Pacheco, uh, in his Arte de la Pintura, describes it as a uh, as an order of things, as a um, as a, as the good taste. Uh, and their uh, their painting, this Spanish painting, seems to be very simple compared to a lot of Italian paintings. And it seems like they use accent a lot. It's uh, you know this the idea of painted strokes like this reminds me very much of the way that we speak Spanish. We in Spanish we have a lot of accents, you know, in the words. Um, need, you know, emphasis here and there. And Spanish painting sort of mimics that. I mean, when you look at this portrait, this is sort of like the, the visual stimulus that is sort of um, balancing this very sort of sterile portrait. Because the if you look at the portrait on Google Arts and Culture, it's a sort of very sterile, very empty portrait. And he sort of anim animates the surface with these touches. Now, I, I love Goya for that, and uh, I've seen these paintings in person. They're very, very successful. Um, he's, he's a lot more, um, I believe that his painting is probably closer to Rembrandt, where he was looking at these effects, 
and really sort of creating visual stimulus, um, uh, more so than Velasquez. Velasquez is more elegance, you know, and movement. Uh, and the way that he drew was elegant in itself. And it seems like Goya here is just just really trying to create that visual, you know, that visual poetry by uh, something unlikely like this. I mean, it's not fully rendered, and from a distance, it, you know, it sits in its in the right place. So uh, that's my opinion about it. But you know, Goya is not for everyone. I will say, I had um, I I had a, a group of friends at the academy that did not like Goya. <laughs> And if they're around, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to mention any names, <laughs> but I, I love Goya. And uh, what I love about Goya is that he's not, he's about visual poetry and he's, he's closer to uh, something like Cervantes and not so much like, you know, um, he's not, he was rejecting a lot of 19th century academic ideals. Um, he the French invaded Spain, and uh, he, although he worked for the French, he was opposed to their occupation of Spain. So his painting is very, um, very Spanish and very, it's almost like a painting of a protest, you know. Um, he wasn't going to use an academic French style. Uh, he rejects that. And um, that was what the French had to... Uh, have promoted, you know, with the the through the French Academy of the 19th century. So that's interesting to analyze, you know, and uh, his his influence sort of persists today, it's, it's specifically with modern painters, which love Goya. I mean, they believe that he was a visionary and he didn't abide by the academy, you know, and that's that's something very powerful. I mean, I, I love his work. Uh, I, although I love classical painting, I will be the first one to tell you that, you know, um, for every rule that I could tell you, there's a million ways to to break those rules. So, um, and he certainly did. I believe he was trying to do that. He was just trying to push the limits of his art in an age where, you know, um, there were a lot of... Uh, political problems, you know, and, and a lot of oppression. So, and a lot of changes in the world, you know, it's the age of enlightenment. And he was interested in, in, in that other visual reality that perhaps we we're not aware of, you know, and uh, he talks about that in a lot of his writings. So even his series, those, those disparates, um, Los Desastres de la Guerra. You know, those are, those are a powerful series, etchings. So here I'm just uh, touching on, on either side. I'm going to go to the other side. And again, these are just quick touches. Um, I have to be very focused on the drawing here because in two seconds this could look really, really bad. <laughs> So I'm going to go with just yellow ochre. And I even see a little bit of red ochre in there, too. Seems like he's applying the same color of the ground just to harmonize a little bit. I even see some perhaps yellow ochre mixed with yellow, red ochre with yellow ochre to get this orange color quality. It may even be the ground, but it seems like he, he, he mixes a little bit of the ground color here and there to just sort of imitate the use of the ground, even though it's not the ground. Certainly, Goya is not for everyone, um, and uh, I know that the art establishment really loves Goya, but a lot of uh, ateliers have rejected his painting as 
you know, I, I've had a lot, I've, I have actually had uh, students tell me that they, they don't think he could draw well. <laughs> and uh, I just laugh because uh, I wish I could draw like this. <laughs> uh, this certainly is a, a amazing artist. And that's why I like to, I, I was, for a long time, I, I wanted to do a, a live presentation on Goya because I believe that, I mean, I've seen his black paintings in the Prado Museum and it's just blown away. It's about, it's among some of the best paintings I've seen. And, um, but a lot of people don't get to see those. And when you see them in reproductions, you can't really uh, appreciate the textures or the, the surfaces, you know? So. So I'm just trying to put these touches here. And I'm gonna go with the white lead and yellow ochre. And this is just an issue of drawing now. I mean, it, it's essentially just drawing with a brush and just hoping that the accidental strokes fall into place there. And, you know, it's, it, it seems that he most likely does this with multiple layers. So, but just to show you, I mean, you could let this dry and then retouch it again. If you're interested in copying this, this painting. This is tough, very tough, because I have to analyze what's underneath. But I like it. I like the, the challenge. So. Let's see. I find myself wiping the brush constantly to get it clean. That's important to do. Just go back to the side of the brush. So I've had some questions about Titian's uh, working method, and I'm going to be addressing uh, his techniques in an upcoming video. And this is the summertime, so we're all traveling. I, I, I was traveling, and um, I got to confess, it's, <laughs> it's difficult to, uh, to do the live presentations and uh, manage other things in the family. So, uh, for those of you that are already uh, vaccinated and are out and about, uh, I imagine you're going through the same thing. Uh, it's great that we are getting vaccinated and that it seems like everyone's back, you know, uh, traveling and visiting museums. I'm eager to visit some museums and I plan to do uh, some live presentations in the future you know, from some museum collections. So, so let's see here. I probably want to get some of this pattern here. Very difficult to, to draw this very random pattern. And I'll probably have to work this over many sessions to get it finished. But I just wanted to, I've had a lot of, um, a lot of subscribers ask about impasto and how to do details. And this is essentially a strategy that was used by a lot of painters just to paint right on top and create this, uh, um, you know, just very sort of solid effect with the impasto by juxtapo Juxtapos the juxtaposition of the color. So not all of it is wet into wet. Uh, a oil painting takes a lot of patience. So okay. And I plan to do a course for those of you that are joining. I plan to do a course uh, this coming semester or a, a live course where I'll be uh, working on these copies. I have four copies that I'm going to be uh, doing. I'm going to be working with the Titian, uh, Murillo, a uh, Bouguereau painting, and uh, in uh, Rubens. And this is a semester-long course. Uh, if you're interested in that information, you could just 
uh, log on to Atelier San Juan org and you can find out more information about that full semester course uh, the course will include uh, the preparation of the layers you know the each uh, ground um, how it was prepared uh, so it's four different schools of painting so I'm going to be working with a few students I have a lot of students signed up so um, make sure to log on and, and check that those links out if you're interested. So the, this um, Naples yellow seems to be a wonderful dryer. That's an advantage and a disadvantage in this case because it seems like the color just gets really, really tacky very quickly, which is great for impasto, but probably not so great if you're modeling flesh or something. So just be aware of that if you're interested in purchasing that color. It's probably a good option if you're wanting to, you know, work on this in the morning and then in the afternoon retouch it. So it's probably a good way to work in one single session on, on something like this. So I'm just finding myself putting these strokes just to imitate the brocade pattern. It seems like it's a gold, brocade gold, or brocade gold or something like that. And it's really beautiful effect over the dark uh, surface underneath. So some highlights here. Now, I think that his paint was probably, and it seems like there's even some color that has been mixed in, uh, some bluish color that has been mixed in. So it could be that he worked over uh, a, a layer of Prussian blue um, because I see some bluish undertones. So that could be also another option. Even here in the shirt, I see, let's see. And again, if you have any questions, you could post your question here on the, in the questions section. So this is a unusual live presentation where I'm painting, but I just wanted to sort of share the process with you guys that I'm using for this painting. I'm using a little bit of Prussian blue here in the shirt, I do see some Prussian blue. And let's see, probably this is further down, so you probably don't see that detail. But I do see some Prussian blue. It seems like the black was definitely mixed with Prussian blue. So let's just lay some color here with Prussian blue. This is a Prussian blue color mixed with black. And that just gives you a nicer, more chromatic dark. So I could see what he was doing there. That's what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna put some, some Prussian blue right there mixed with black. Lifting it down with oil just slightly. This, this creates a blue-black color, gives you a nicer effect. So, okay, so I have a question here. Um, will you desaturate the background to reflect the shadow underneath the chin? So um, the background is actually, I'm, so as I worked on this, I realized that the background could be also a blue-black color um, and it, just so it, it recedes, and I did not do that. But in one, in one, in another layer, I could do a, uh, uh, you know, a reflective color quality here. 
So it seems now that I'm you know, getting the painting fully realized here, uh, there's a lot of blue black and uh, yeah, so the, it seems in, I, I did another copy of a Vermeer for here for the channel. And it seems that these uh, black backgrounds were probably either mixed with some sort of blue uh, color and it's just to get this bluish black effect, you know? So um, it's, a, it's something that I notice in a lot of the chemical analysis they find. And it's hard to see in the reproduction. I mean, the, the, the reproduction that I have is, I, it doesn't have that subtlety at all, you know? So I just have this reproduction that is quite nice, but it doesn't have this, uh, it could never pick up the subtlety of, a, you know, of being there in front of the painting. So that's why it's always best to copy in the museum or at least take notes, color notes. So. so I'm, and the camera cannot, I mean, it, my camera is, uh, it's oversaturating this. This is much, much more lighter in, in there's a reddish quality to the back, you know, to the background, so. But the camera is overexposing, you know? So it's overexposing this and underexposing that, so. In, at, it's, at some point in the future, perhaps an investment in a, camera with a higher dynamic range would, would really help me uh, be able to demonstrate some of these subtleties. So I'm retouching some of these areas with the blue black. And I demonstrated how to make this color, the Prussian blue. It's a really beautiful color. For those of you that are interested in creating a a nice uh, a color, a blue that is not so intense, especially for this uh, more monochromatic paintings. Doesn't seem like this, you know, somebody like Goya was working with a lot of color, at least not later on in his life. Early on he was, he was working with brighter colors, but as he got older, his, his palette, much like Rembrandt, became a lot more Monochromatic. So I hope that you have enjoyed this small demonstration. I could work on this for uh, hours and hours. This is about two sessions so far that I've uh, dedicated to this painting. And um, it's just a, a, a way to sort of assemble and, and figure out how, how these painters were uh, working with some of their paintings. Um, and by recreating the technique and using the same ground, the same materials, uh, I'm able to see a sort of the working sequence or at least a closer working sequence. Uh, this is very different from the way that we would be working today. Um, an ala prima painter would, you know, make short work of this in an hour or two, well, probably three hours, but that's not the paint, the way that this painting was worked. I mean, it seems that Goya let areas dry and then he repainted on top. Uh, a lot of the details were, these details were repainted on top uh, in seco. And um, there is one little detail. Goya mentions the use of a heat bodied oil with lead, with lethargy. I am using that oil. I did use that oil to oil out thin down with um, uh, minerals, not mineral spray, excuse me, spike oil of lavender. And uh, he mentions that the reason that they're using that oil is because a lot of the oils that he's able to get are being adulterated with non-drying oils, which I found very interesting. Um, I I never I, I read that on a on, there's a if for my Spanish speaking audience there's a nice PDF that I've shared and it has that detailed in in documented as him writing to somebody else and complaining about uh, the quality of the oil and him having to uh, cook the oil with lead in order for the oil to dry properly. So that's, that was an interesting detail. 
And I thought I shared uh, that uh, detail with you guys because I've had a lot of painters ask me why the lead and you know uh, how where they could get this leaded oil. Well, I make my own leaded oil, and I in this case I'm using walnut leaded oil um, or walnut heat bodied oils, essentially walnut oil cooked with uh, litharge. Um, but there's hundreds of recipes in all the manuscripts about it. So you could find a lot of recipes or you could, if you log on to uh, some of the websites that I've shared, uh, like Kramer Pigments, Secchi, or even Natural Pigments, they sell this type of oil. So it's very useful because the paint will dry very quickly. Um, so, well, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and I'm going to be uh, sharing um, some of the links below in the description below. And for those of you, again, that are coming by and commenting and sharing your questions, I really appreciate the support. I really appreciate the visit. Uh, we will continue with more demonstrations in the future. And if, for those of you that are looking for more uh, a structure course uh, with, uh, you know, different chapters and progressive steps, check out my courses on Udemy. I have four courses available. I just released my new Rembrandt course. And for those of you that are looking for a live presentation uh, course with critiques, live critiques and uh, semester uh, assignments, uh, semester long courses, you could log on to ateliersanjuan.org or just write me a private message. All right, well, I hope you guys have a great weekend. Thanks again for joining. Take care, have a good one.